going to invite you in a moment. Um, I'm going to invite you in a moment um, to take a look at two texts that I am about to put on the screen. Now, of course, I'm a literacy person, so shout out to all of my literacy people here. And um, all of you know that literacy extends beyond just the reading and writing classroom. We know that literacy is in everything that we do in science. Literacy is everything we do in social studies. We are like, when we consider like numeracy and the work that we do in math, that too is literacy, right? And so I'm gonna put two texts on the board to get us thinking today. Your job, when I put these two texts on the board, I'm gonna give you 45 seconds, which is not a lot of time, right? I'm gonna give you 45 seconds to read these two texts and here's your job. Your job is to determine the differences between these two texts. And so as our warm up today, I'm gonna to put two texts on the screen and your job is to analyze those two texts and determine the differences between these two texts. Now, I know that many of you are sitting in watch parties or in large gatherings, some of you are at home, but um, if you've got any like wonderings, you can give me a thumbs up or a question in the chat, but like, yeah, your job is gonna be really easy here. 45 seconds, determine the differences between these two texts. Everybody ready? All right, here we go. I'm gonna give you 45 seconds to examine these two texts and determine the differences between the two. Here you are. I think believe it or not, we've only got 30 seconds left of consideration. I hope that you're already getting the sense that this webinar is an interactive one. So I'm gonna be asking you to think and to question, to probe as we make our way through our hour together this evening. You've got 15 seconds left to look at these two texts, analyze them and determine the differences between these two texts. Take your final five seconds. All right, I'm removing these two texts from the screen temporarily. So these two texts have gone away. Um, but here's why I wanted you to do that activity. That so much of what we think about when it comes to serving kids is about what we see. And we have to do all of our seeing sometimes in the midst of chaos, right? And so you got a chance to see those two texts and you determine the differences between these two texts. Now, there are some of you who found lots of differences. Like this was actually given to me by my neighbor who's seven, the kid in the apartment next door loves these puzzles and he gave them to me. I found the first time I looked at it, I found four differences between these two texts. He of course is an expert at these things. And he's like, oh, well, Mr. Minor, I found six. Um, and, and I'm wondering, um, and I know that I'm not in the same room with you, but I'm wondering how many you found in these two texts. So I'm about to put these two texts back on the screen so you can take another look at them, right? Um, and when you take another look at these two texts, here's what I'm interested in. Of course, I'm interested in what you found, but I am more keenly interested in how you found it. So I'm about to put these two texts back on the screen. And here's what I would like for you to write in your notebook. What method did you employ in order to determine the differences between those two images? How did you do it, right? That again, so much of our work is seeing. And so I'm very interested in how we see, right? And so I'm about to put these two texts back on the screen, these two images, they're back on the screen here. And of course, I am interested in what you found but I am more profoundly interested in how you found it. So take a little bit of time and in your notebook, reflect to yourself, what method did I use to determine the differences between these two texts? Did you start at the top and scan to the bottom? Did you break the images up into quadrants and look at the upper left and then the upper right? Did you take a detail-oriented approach and look at specific detail in each photos? Did you start big and go small? How did you do this? Take a moment and write in your notebook because here's what I would like for you to think with me about. I'm about to put another challenge on the screen. I'm about to put two new texts on the screen. But when you encounter these two new texts, here's the thing. You now have a little bit of schema. You've got some experience. And so as you engage, these two new images that I'm about to put on the screen, I wanna invite you first to think about what method do you want to use to approach these two images? Are you gonna use the same method that you use with these last two images? So you're gonna start at the top and then scan to the bottom? 
Are you going to break it up into quadrants? Are you going to look at specific details? Are you going to look at like the big, big picture? How are you going to approach this next challenge? Again, given that we are approaching this second challenge with experience in hand. And so I want to give you just a few seconds to determine how you want to approach this second two images. All right. So now you're deciding, or you've already decided how you want to approach these second two images. So I'm about to put two new images on the screen. And your job is exactly the same. Your job is to look at these two images and to determine the difference between these two images. I'm gonna give you the same amount of time, 45 seconds. Everybody ready? All right, here we go. Again, you're looking at these two images and you're determining the difference between these two images. Ah, my favorite actor, Dwayne Johnson. Now, I know that many of you are at home or in your shared spaces looking at each other like, what? What is this challenge? These two images are profoundly different than the first challenge that I engaged you with. I engaged you with an earlier challenge where the two images were similar. And then again, the second challenge is where the two images were of the same person, but not at all similar. And here's the thing. This warm-up serves as an important metaphor for our study together this evening. That you looked at the first two images. You regarded the first puzzle. Many of you may even be in rooms where you talked about it with friends, right? You looked at the first two images and you thought about those first two images and you developed strategy. You developed a successful approach that was based on your experience to solve the puzzle. And then when we went to the second puzzle, it's like the entire game changed. That's a metaphor for our last few years of teaching that you all have spent the last few years developing research-based and experience-based ways to solve complicated school-based problems. And yet we've come back to this year and in so many ways, it feels like the entire game has changed. And so I wanna spend the rest of our time together this evening thinking alongside you about how we continue to deal when the game keeps changing. And here's the first step. Here's what I know, that in 2022 to teach or really to lead for um, our department heads and our leaders in the room, to teach or to lead in 2022 is a metaphor that it's not actually teaching. teaching it's art. It's not a job title or a position. It is an act of creation, right? That what we do every day is an articulated act of creation. And so when we think about our work every day, another thing that I want to ask you as we begin today is if teaching, if leadership is an act of creation, when you look out at your community, what is it that you hope to create? I'm going to give you a few moments to think about that. And as you think about that, I want to tell you a story. So again, as you think about your work as an educator, and when you look out at your community, what is it that you are trying to create? And I want to start with a story and situate today's work in some of my own experience. Um, this photo that I'm putting on the screen is a photo that I'm just now starting to share. Um, and, um, and, and this is as me on, um, interestingly enough, on my very first day in the teaching profession. This is me as a college senior at Florida A&M University. Again, my first day in the teaching profession. In this photo, I am on my way to my very first day of student teaching. Right. And so here I am a senior. I'm pictured here with several of my friends and they had come down to wish me well on my first day of student teaching. You know, as you know, many of you who are education majors, you know that, you know, your friends who are in other majors are still going to class on campus. But when you're a senior, all of your time is spent at school at student teaching. And so this was me on my first day in 1999 at Florida A&M University. Now, for those of you who haven't ever heard me talk about my alma mater, Florida A&M University, I'm a proud graduate of Florida A&M University, one of the largest historically black colleges 
in the United States. And, and I talk about Florida a and lots, and there's so much to be proud of when you've gone to FAMU, but like I talk about Florida a and lots specifically because I am proudest of the fact that Florida a and University graduates more Black teachers than almost any institution in our country, right? And so I am one of a proud tradition, right? And so this day represented more than just me. This is me taking my first steps into a classroom, but surrounded by others who were studying to, to influence our communities, right? And, and I'm a third generation teacher. So I had, you know, my grandmother and my mother kind of like cheering me on on this day. And, and the reason I chose this image um, for this talk is because on this day, I leave my beautiful campus full of aspiring young professionals, especially teachers, right? And I leave and I enter a second grade classroom for the first time as an educator. Now, of course, I'm working with my collaborating teacher there in Leon County, Florida, Ms. Cates, who ran this beautiful second grade classroom. And I, and, you know, and, and I was nervous because it was my first day. I wanted to do my best, right? So my friends wish me well, and I get to school. And I'm in school for about two hours. It's about 10 a.m. now. Um, and, and again, this is 1999. So if you'll remember, um, this is before the era of cell phones, right? And so at about 10 a.m., um, I get a page on my pager. And for those of you who don't remember pagers, it's a little box that you'd wear on your belt, right? Double A battery. And, and, and a number flashes on the page, right? It is my roommate. Um, and, and I ignore it because it is my first day of school and I want to make a good impression. So you don't, you know, and, and the way the pagers worked is you get this message and, and and it didn't have a cell phone line attached to it. So you'd have to go to the office and return the phone call. So I get this page and it's my roommate. A few moments later, I get another page and it's my parents. I decide to turn my pager off just because again, I don't want to be answering calls in the middle of my first day. By 11 a.m., I had about 17 missed calls. All of them were from either my roommate or from my parents. And so even though I wanted to make a powerful first impression on that first day, I begged my collaborating teacher, can I go to the office and return at least one of these calls? Something must be going on. And my hunch was absolutely right. There was something going on. On my very first day in the profession, I leave my beautiful campus and I go to a second grade classroom to engage in our shared work together. And I call my roommate and he was panicked on the other end of the line because this had happened. My campus, Florida A&M University, had been attacked. Um, and, um, and this is the newspaper clipping from that day. This is um, September 23rd, 1999, my very first day of student teaching, my senior year of college. Um, my campus had been attacked. And this is again, 1999. So this is before we had the language for national security. This is before folks talked a lot about domestic terrorism, right? That, that my campus suffered through this tragedy. And I was a student leader at the time. So I begged my collaborating teacher if I could rush back to campus. And I spent the rest of that day supporting friends, helping kids to like, you know, gather money to get phone cards to call back home, right? You know, like helping to find friends and make sure that everyone was safe. You know, I spent the day, you know, really in kind of the, the worst kind of stress that one could think about for a young person. Again, here pictured in this newspaper clip, I'm a college senior, right? And as that day wore on, there were so many questions. I found like myself confronting this anger and I didn't know where this anger was coming from, right? I was so angry that this would happen to my campus. I was so angry that my friends and I were made to suffer through this. But I was lucky on that day because I had professors and teachers who knew something that I still employ to this day, that I had professors and teachers who knew that our work is more than just curriculum and compliance. I had professors and teachers who challenge existing norms of how we do education, who challenge systems, that in that moment, they knew that I needed safety and security. In that moment, they knew that I needed ways to feel good about myself and about my community. They knew that I needed tools to ensure that I could craft a world better than the one that I was currently standing in. My professors and my you know, teachers knew that I needed awareness and understanding. They knew that I needed space to process the world around me and ways to express my feelings in ways that made sense to me. They knew that I needed ways to understand all of the people who might be experiencing that same reality, but in different ways. My professors and my teachers knew in that moment that I needed connection, 
They knew that I needed ways to connect what I was learning in class to the reality that I was experiencing in my community. My professors and teachers knew that I also needed proximity, that I needed proximity to people and to ideas who could affirm me, and I needed proximity to people and to ideas who could challenge me. Now, here's why I'm talking about this here, and here's why I'm talking about it this evening, because I leave my college campus you know, in 1999, you know, that was fall of 1999. I graduated in the spring of 2000. And I moved back to get my very own classroom that fall, right? And so I'm a brand new baby teacher on my own fall 2000. And I'm starting my career and I'm trying to make my way through, you know, make sense of the world. And you know how those first years can be, right? And as I am just finding my way in my first few years, this happens. But again, I am a New York City educator. And on this morning, I have to look out at my own students as they navigate tragedy. And as I looked out at my own students as they navigated this hardship, I realized that my students in this moment needed exactly what I had needed just months before, that they needed safety and security. They needed awareness and understanding. They needed connection. Again, our work is more than just curriculum and compliance. Now, here's the thing. As I think about all of these things, we're not just thinking about the teaching work that we do, the science, the math, the social studies, the language arts, right? We're not just thinking about content. We're not just thinking about community. We're not just thinking about citizenship. Rather, we as educators in moments like this are thinking about all of these things in the context of a very complicated world, right? And here's the thing. As we usher kids into this 2022-2023 school year, one of the things that I realize is that the world will always be complicated and kids are always going to need these things, safety and security, awareness and understanding, connection. And so the rest of our time together today, I want to think about how we navigate school-based systems so that we can deliver these essential realities to children right? And I want to pause here and give you another moment to reflect that I showed you the moments that catalyzed my own identity as an educator, right? But what were the moments that catalyzed yours? I want you to think back to when you first stepped foot into a school, into a classroom, when you first took on this calling, what is your why? Take a few moments and think about that. You can jot things down in your notebook, you can sketch, you can draw, but take a few moments to think about that. And as you do, one of the things that I wanted to kind of share with you is I think about my why all the time, that again, our work is more than just curriculum and compliance. And one of the things that you're probably writing in your notebook right now, one of the things that I know about you because I've spent time among you and your colleagues, one of the things that I know is that none of us came to this profession to enforce the discipline policy or to make kids feel bad about what they have not learned yet or to be involved in curriculum wars, that we are all here. We are all present this evening, right? We're all in this profession because we know the power of learning and thinking. And we believe in our individual and in our collective power to foster communities of lifelong learners and thinkers, right? We're in this profession because we all know that this is what changes communities. But things are hard now, right? And so we wanna do this in the face of the myriad challenges that we have to encounter and that we navigate. And as we encounter and navigate challenges, there are sometimes things that prevent us from pursuing our why. There are sometimes things that prevent us from reaching toward those goals that you're thinking about in your notebook right now, right? And one of those things, when I think about the things that sometimes cloud my vision, when I think about the things that sometimes stand in my way, One of those things is tradition, right? Cornelius, this is how it's supposed to go. Cornelius, this is how we've always done it. Cornelius, this is the rule, you know, that has been given for the eighth grade team. Cornelius, this is what the curriculum says do and we can't deviate. But sometimes when I am thinking about the passion that I brought to this profession and how that dims, especially in hard times, sometimes it's tradition. 
But sometimes it's not tradition. Sometimes it's policy, right? Sometimes we look around and we feel trapped by rules and regulations and expectations and, and responsibility, right? And then sometimes it's not even that. Sometimes when we look around and we ask ourselves, well, am I moving toward those big goals that I had when I started this journey? Sometimes it's fatigue, right? Sometimes it's the fact that, that for many of us, we're up late at night with our own families and then we're up early in the morning to prepare for school. We spend lots of hours commuting, right? And so sometimes it's our own fatigue. And so as you reflect today, again, another question. When you think about the reality that you envision for yourself when you started this journey, how close are you to that reality? Why? And how does this make you feel? I'm going to stop talking for exactly 30 seconds just to give you some time to catch up in your notebook. Again, when you think about like the reality that you envision for yourself when you step foot into this pursuit, how close are you to that reality? How does it make you feel? I want to give you 30 seconds. And then I want to spend, again, the rest of our time this evening really thinking about some concrete ways that we move forward. You've got a few seconds left as you're thinking. Excellent. Thank you so much for doing that, you know, for yourself, that I think reflection is really important. Um, and as you hold on to that notebook, as you hold on to those ideas, I want to now pivot to think about then how we move forward, right? And what it can be like to navigate this moment. Right. And and the term that I'm putting forward is a term that I have been obsessed with for the last three and a half years that I think all the time about being radically and profoundly pro kid, especially now. Right. That when I think about our work in communities and much of my work is with teens and preteens. And I know that there are several of you in this room who work across the age spectrum. Right. But one of the things that I think a lot about is that it is our job to create opportunities for all children. Of course, with respect to history and to the environment and to the myriad groups of people that share our planet. But again, it is our job to create opportunity for all children. And so when I think about what it means to be pro-kid, that means that anything that stands in the way of opportunity for a child compromises our work. And here's the thing about having a pro-kid stance, that you can't work toward being pro-kid if we have no real convictions, right? That this work requires some conviction and work toward this kind of a future in school is work. It doesn't happen just because you decide to be nice or kind, right? That, that being pro-kid requires us to change things about ourselves and about our institutions, right? And here's what makes this all very challenging. The people tend to fear and dislike change. And so as we change ourselves and as we change our institutions to be more pro-kid, some of that fear and dislike will be hurled at you, right? That taking a pro-kid stance is not a program, right? It's not a box you can buy. It doesn't come in a kit. I can't sell it to you, right? But that taking a pro-kid stance requires some work. And we're going to spend the rest of our time this evening thinking about our work. Right. And, um, and, and, and this uh, is, is my parents. Right. So much of what I am um, barring today, I think about the wisdom of my parents. Right. And on the left, you see young me um, and my mom. And on the right, you see um, young me and my pop. My parents were two of the hardest working folks and, and, and they taught me a lot. And as I think about navigating hardship in our work right now, I often ask myself, who are the people in my life who have navigated hardship before and how did they do it? What are the lessons that I can borrow from them, right? And so when I think about navigating hardship right now, I often look to my parents um, for the myriad ways that they navigated hardship as they were raising me. 
And there was one moment that comes to mind, you know, my dad um, was, was a really big believer in family transparency. And we'd have these conversations about how the family was doing. And we'd all sit, me, my sister, my mom, and I would all sit. Um, and my dad would talk to us about the challenges of keeping our family afloat. He would talk to us about the challenges of putting food on the table or the challenges of finding enough money for a soccer camp that I wanted to go to. And there was one afternoon where I was just so tired um, of talking about family challenges. You know, I wanted to go on a field trip and my parents couldn't afford the field trip. And my father sat me down and he said, you know, Cornelius, this is just not a trip that you're going to take. Um, and he explained to me why, and he explained to me how hard he works and how hard my mom works um, and, and where the money goes. And so he just said to me, you know, Cornelius, this is not a trip that, that your sister and you are going to take. Um, and I remember in my youthful anger, just kind of saying to my dad, like, I don't need to know all of this. I don't want to have a conversation about like how hard you work and about how much money you make and about where the money goes and how we pay the bills. Like, I just want to be able to go on trips like my friends. Right. But my father said to me in, in that moment, he's like, you know, Cornelius in life, you're going to encounter moments where things are hard and you're going to encounter moments where things are impossible. And when you encounter those moments, you have a choice, young man. Um, and he said to me in that moment, what I am summoning in this one, he said to me that you can choose to face hardship by burying your head in the sand. You can choose to face hardship by lashing out at your friends and your family, or you can choose to face hardship by employing like creative ideas and thinking. You can choose to face hardship by looking at the people around you and holding them close, right? He's like, young man, you have a choice, right? And so as I think about this moment in school, I am really taking my father's wisdom and applying it to everything that we're experiencing now in school. And one of the things that I want to posit as we think about architecting the way forward together is that there is a profound difference between simply moving through difficulty and actively facing difficulty. As we think about how to navigate systems, right, and there's a lot more that I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but as we think about how to navigate systems, I think it's important that we first consider the difficulties that we face, right? That simply moving through difficulty, I'm naming here as passive, right? Moving through difficulty is simply like going with the flow, but actively facing difficulty, I'm labeling here as active. And there's a profound difference between the two, right? That moving through difficulty is characterized by several sentiments or ideas, right? If I just hold on, this thing is going to be over soon. This hardship is going to be over soon, right? Or this hardship must be happening to me because somehow I'm not working hard enough or because somehow I'm not smart enough, right? Or, and this is a classic one that often happens in school spaces, right? That if I just wait, somebody in charge is going to have a solution for me. They're going to rescue me by telling me what to do. Moving through difficulty does not address the difficulty itself. When we are architecting the way forward for kids, especially in years like this one, facing difficulty actively means that things are going to be messy and some things are even going to be left undone. This does not mean that we have failed. Facing difficulty means that we can prioritize student learning without centering the dogma that has historically been sold to us as the way to do teaching or the way to do school. Facing difficulty in moments like this one means that we understand that the verb to solve, what it means to solve our problems right now, does not mean that things go back to how they used to be. That's not the goal. Solving this moment means that we develop an understanding that things are not going to look like they used to look. That facing difficulty ensures that we are the architects of our own experience and of our own happiness. Now, how can that go, right? And, and, and so here's what I want to, to leave with you this evening, that there are two big considerations that I want to leave with you for your work moving forward. That the question that I often ask myself again is what does it mean to have an instructional focus when I look around and everything feels impossible, right? So here is the first consideration that I have for us this evening, that we can be nimble. Consideration number one, again, we can be nimble, that our work in this moment is not about the perfect execution of initiatives or programs, right? That our work in this moment is about powerful learning experiences for kids 
that are defined by the high expectations that we have for them. That any programmatic approach is simply that. It's a possible approach. Now, I want to dig deeper into what I mean by this, right? That, that of course, um, when we create or develop or build learning experiences for kids, the outcome matters, right? That, that when I, you know, craft an experience in language arts for kids, like I'm crafting those experiences because I want kids to be able to think critically and form claims. I want them to be able to establish those claims in speaking and in writing, and I want them to be able to support those claims, right? Those are all outcomes, right? And when kids move toward learning outcomes, one of the things that's important to hold on to is that the path that we take to get there might look different in some circumstances, in some contexts, or in some classrooms that we can get really good at choosing the paths that work best for the kids in front of us. And of course, the paths that work best for us. Now, I want to give a few examples of what I mean by this. And those of you who studied with me last year, we started this together, right? We started this together in our journey that I often ask myself, like, how does all of this thinking connect to our commitment to children, right? And, and as we started our study together last spring, one of the things that we established last spring when we were together is that there are some approaches to teaching that do not see all children, right? You know, and, and like we talked before, the dogma, right? Like policy, like tradition, right? You know, that, that sometimes what will happen, and if you take a t look at the top of this pyramid here, you know, sometimes we tell ourselves, well, I'm going to commit to this kind of teaching, right? Because this is how it's supposed to be done, or this is how it's always been done here, or this is the tradition, or this is what the curriculum says. And so sometimes in school, there are some approaches to teaching that do not see all students. And instead of reimagining or remixing our curricular experiences or our classroom experiences to meet the needs of kids, instead of remixing or reimagining, we often demand that kids conform to us. Now, here's the thing. Now, looking at the top of this pyramid, we know that this is not okay, but also kids know that this is not okay, right? And when we studied together last spring, one of the things that we established is no kid ever is going to send me the well-worded email that says, dear Mr. Minor, the way that you constructed this learning experience does not work for me as a learner, right? I'm rarely ever going to get that email from a kid. Rather, what happens is I see it in their behavior. Rather, I see it in their growth or in their engagement, right? That, that when kids are not plugged into a learning experience, it shows up in their behavior, right? It shows up in their growth. It shows up in their engagement. Now, what often happens, and I, I'm thinking now about the great Carla Shalaby who wrote the book Troublemakers. And in that book, she says that in school, behavior is a form of communication, right? And what often happens, because we are so busy, instead of asking ourselves, what is this child? What are these children attempting to communicate to us through their behaviors? Instead of asking that question, we often label kids. So kids get labeled as deficient or as defiant. And then we use those labels to sort or to group or to segregate or to categorize kids, right? And so what ends up happening in so many school spaces, if you look at the base of this pyramid that I've drawn on your screen here, what ends up happening in so many school spaces is that we end up treating kids as if they are broken. And so conversations at school become all about how we quote unquote fix the bad kids, right? Instead of reflecting inward, how might we reimagine the school experience to work better for kids? Blame gets shifted to children and to communities. Now, as I discuss this here with you now, I think it's important to name that this trend that I am describing this trend that we're studying this evening happens disproportionately to multilingual children and to children with learning disabilities and to kids from groups that have been historically marginalized in institutions like school. And of course, all of this leads to less learning, which connects to so many other success indicators at school. And so ultimately what happens is that kids have fewer opportunities in life because of how we have historically done school. And so here's what I mean when I name systemic reinvention. And we get to do some of that together this evening. That if the way that school operates has historically harmed some people, then we are allowed to reimagine what it means to do school. I want to say that again really clearly. 
because this is the focal point of our work together this year. That if the ways the school operates have historically harmed some people, then we can reimagine what it means to do school. That things should not be what they used to be, especially given what we know about students today. Now, I wanna pause because several of you are looking at me like, well, Cornelius, I am a teacher. I'm not the superintendent. I'm not the principal. I am not the president. I'm not the governor. How can I reimagine what it means to do school? What can I do? And here's the thing. When it comes to child-centered or community-facing work, it's really easy to see the big things and become overwhelmed by them. It's not so easy to see the small things that we can actually do. So it's easy for me to tell myself that, oh my gosh, this is bigger than me, right? Only the superintendent or the principal can fix this. I often wonder where can I make a difference? And so this is how I want to organize my thinking for you. But I often think about two things. Of course, there's my realm of concern, right? There are all of the things that I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the student experience. I'm concerned about access. I'm concerned about transportation. I'm concerned about meals, right? There are all of the things that I'm concerned about, right? My realm of concern is huge. But I have to ask myself, Cornelius, what are the things that are actually within your realm of actual influence, right? Cornelius, you know, like I am a seventh, eighth, and ninth grade literacy coach, right? And so I get to ask myself, as a coach, what are the things that you can touch? What are the things that you can change? What are the things that you can influence? So there's my realm of concern, which is huge. I don't want to live there. I want to identify and live in my realm of influence. And here's how I do this. I start by understanding systems. And I want to take a small moment to begin to do some of that work with you this evening, right? Now, when I talk about understanding systems, it's important to note that in communities like ours, inequity does not always happen because people are mean or unkind. Let's say that again. In communities like ours, inequity does not happen because people are mean or unkind. The conversation on equity often gets derailed when we make it just about how we treat one another in interpersonal relationships or about something insensitive that somebody said, right? It is all that and more, right? That institutional harm sometimes happens because of the institution itself. Not because the people are mean, but because of how the institution is built. And we can learn to see this and respond to it. I want to tell you a little story. I was working on a case study actually last year when we started our work together. Um, and, and some of you remember me starting this work. Um, and, and, and it's a whole like, um, you know, school year later. And I've like gotten toward the end of this work. But um, there was an interesting call I got not too long ago um, to work in a district much like yours and mine. Um, it's a superintendent that I have admired for my entire career. And so when I got this call from him, I was beside myself with joy. Um, and this is a person that I admire and I've been wanting to work with for a long time. And he invited me to his district. And this is what the phone call um, went like. He said, you know, Cornelius, um, we're really struggling um, here. Um, and, and I was like, you know, like everyone is, it's a pandemic, you know, I, you know, again, this is a person that I admire. He's like, no, you know, I've been looking at AP scores across my district. Um, and so he was talking specifically about his juniors and his seniors. Um, of course, we're, we're all, we've all spent the last few years so concerned about graduation. Um, but he was like, I've been looking at my AP scores for my juniors and my seniors, especially in science. And he says to me, Cornelius, this is what I'm noticing. When I'm looking at AP chemistry and AP physics, and I look at that AP exam score that the kids get back in the summer, he said, I'm noticing that my boys are scoring higher than the girls on the AP exam in both chemistry and physics. And I'm concerned because it's been two years in a row and this is the trend. Um, and, and I remember nodding my head as he talked. Um, and then he said something that was really jarring to me. He said, Cornelius, will you partner with me? Because we need to figure out how we fix the girls. There's something wrong. Like we need, like it's motivation. It's something like there's something wrong with the girls and we need to figure this out. And I remember looking and thinking, you know, this is back when we we're all calling each other on Zoom. And I was like, I don't think there's something wrong with half the human population. There cannot be something wrong with girls that is getting them here. He was like, no, but I'm looking at the scores, Cornelius. And when I look at the scores, my boys are scoring really high. My girls are not. There's something wrong. 
Um, and again, I doubled down. I was like, I'm not quite sure that we can just wholesale declare that there's something wrong with the girls. So I asked, can I come to your district and study alongside you and your people to really get to the bottom of what's happening? He's like, sure, I've got all the scores here and I can show you. And so, of course, I get there. He shows me the scores. He's like, you know, for my last two years, um, we're coming upon our third year testing in pandemic times. And for the last two years, you know, the, the girls haven't scored very well. The boys have scored, you know, relatively high. And I'm concerned. And, and instead of just spending time looking at spreadsheets and scores, I asked the question, could I visit you know, some of your families, specifically the families who have girls enrolled in either AP chemistry or AP physics. And he's like, sure. And I was like, I just want to do some data collection. And so I, I, I set out to visit families. He generated this beautiful list of, of families who had young women involved in either AP chemistry or AP physics. And so I set out to go visit and speak with families. I had a bunch of meetings with different groups of kids and parents to really learn about the AP chemistry and AP physics experience. And the very first family that I sat with, it was a father and his daughter. And here, Here's what they told me. Um, you know, this father was a proud dad. He was so excited to, to host me. Um, and he was so proud for me to meet his daughter. He's like, my daughter's a senior this year. She's headed to Stanford in the fall. He was so proud. Um, and I was like, well, I'm actually not here to talk about Stanford. I'm actually here to talk about last year's AP exam um, and, and, and the experience, you know, that, that, you know, I talked to the school and they said that your daughter didn't have such a positive experience with last year's AP exam. And he's like, let me stop you right here, Mr. Miner. And this is what he says to me. He tells me this story. He says, this district has fallen on hard times since the pandemic. That, um, and because we have hard times, there have been budget cuts like everywhere in the country. And he's like, our budget cuts have really impacted the sciences. He's like, it used to be in this district, if you took AP chemistry or AP physics, it used to be you had 90 minutes um, per day of AP chemistry or AP physics that the kids would come and they would have 45 minutes of AP class and then they would have 45 minutes of AP lab. And so he's like, it used to be every kid that was enrolled in the AP program had 90 minutes. Again, 45 minutes of AP class, 45 minutes of AP lab. And so he's like, our district, because we've invested so much time in our AP program, our district has this powerful history of scoring really well because the kids have 90 minutes every day, 45 of class, 45 of lab. But he's like, when the pandemic came, we looked at the budget and lab was an expensive thing to run a lab every day for kids. And so what the district did, um, since AP was considered a non-essential course, what the district did was they moved lab to once a week, once a week after school from Mondays, on Mondays from three to six. And, and, and his father, he says to me, again, we used to have lab every day. Now the kids only have 45 minutes of class and we have lab once a week after school from three to six. And he says, Mr. Miner, I love education. I love my daughter. I want her to do well. I have supported her throughout her entire journey. She's headed to Stanford in the fall. I am that dad. But he says, my family only has one car. And so my daughter, when faced with the choice of having to stay after school from three to, six, to, three to six after school, three to five after school, he's like, those evenings, it gets dark out. And I'm at work with the car. And so if my daughter's going to go to AP lab, she's going to have to walk home in the dark. And I'm not so comfortable with my daughter walking home in the dark. So instead of her doing lab after school on Mondays, she comes home after school and we do lab at the kitchen table when I get off work, right? And, and it was really powerful for me to hear that father tell that story. And as I went from the house to the next house, to the next house, to the next house, overwhelmingly parents of girls had the same story, right? That because lab ends in the evening, my daughter can't go. The more interviews I did, the more I heard parents of boys not express the same concern. For parents of boys, they didn't mind their young people walking home after dark. But for parents of girls, walking home after dark was a hardship, right? And so they'd rather keep their kids at home because walking home after dark was a hardship. And so when I got back to the district office, I had an interesting realization that it wasn't that the girls were missing something. It wasn't that the girls were not motivated. It wasn't that the girls were not good at science. It was simply because the system that had been built in that district was inhospitable to girls who wanted to study AP chemistry or AP physics because they had to walk home in the evenings after lab in the dark, right? 
And so it wasn't a, we need to fix the girl's problem. It wasn't a, there's something wrong with the girl's problem. It wasn't a, the girls aren't motivated problem. It was the way that AP chemistry and physics had been built, right? Does that make sense for everybody in this room? I want to make sure we understand that, right? Because it wasn't the kids, it was the system, right? And so when we think about understanding systems, here's like, you know, what I want to name and here's what I want to grapple with, right? Across our year together. When I ask myself, what is a system? A system, rules, traditions, customs, or policies that are applied to a community that have a negative impact on specific members of that community, sometimes because of who they are, right? And so in the story that I just told you, right, that system of doing AP chemistry lab after school had a negative impact on girls who came from families that had one car or no cars, right? Like, and so, so that, um, so that idea there, like it wasn't the girls themselves, it was like that idea of the system, right? And here's the thing, systems exist at the district level, right? Like I just shared with you, that was a system that existed at the district level. There are also systems that exist at the school level. But one of the things that I am most excited to engage you around this evening is the fact that there are systems that exist at the classroom level. And those are the systems that are within my realm of influence, right? And so when I think about systems and the systems that exist everywhere, I wanna give you a moment just to kind of think because I've just shared a lot with you. Um, and so as you think um, with me, I've got three big questions before I go on to unpack this in our last 10 minutes together, right? What is being confirmed for you so far today? As we work together this evening, what new ideas or thoughts are emerging for you? Also, what questions do you have, right? And as you're thinking about all of this, I want to tie all of this together. You know, and the beautiful thing about this series is that we get a chance to revisit these ideas throughout the year together, right? Um, but I want to tie all this together for now, especially in the beginning of our school year. That I often ask myself, well, Cornelius, what are the systems that are within my realm of influence, right? What are the things that I can impact, right? I can't impact necessarily those district level things yet, right? I'm not a district level person. I can't impact, you know, all the school level things, but there are things that are within my realm of influence as an educator, right? That when I think about something as basic or as simple as decorations, or when I think about something as, as you know, as, as, as profound and important and central as grading and expectations, right? Like those are all systems that can either include kids or exclude kids, right? And so do my systems for grading allow for all kids to be fully present, right? That if I create a grading system that only recognizes kids' intelligence, if they can write, I'm leaving out all of the kids who express their genius in speaking. If I express create a grading system that only recognizes the genius of kids who can construct or build, then I'm leaving out all of the kids who can perform or narrate, right? And so is my grading system flexible and, and inclusive enough, right? And then I have power over that. I have power over my discipline policies. That's within my realm of influence. Do my discipline policies create space for kids to re-enter the community after they have violated community trust, right? Do my discipline policies seek to embarrass or do my discipline policies seek to include, right? That all of those are things that we can control as classroom teachers. My curriculum and how I employ it, right? The recess habits that I might have, the adult-student relationships, the relationships that I have with family, communication, community traditions, all of these are systems that are within our realm of influence. I'm not a principal, I'm not a superintendent, but everything on this list is something that I have the final say over. When I'm crafting classroom culture, when I'm building my seating arrangements, when I'm building classroom procedures, all of those are systems that can either include kids or exclude kids, right? So what are the systems that are within my realm of influence? Now, here's how I think about those systems. And again, these are the three reflective questions that I hope that you're holding on to right? But here's how I think about those systems, right? I often think about what action can look like. And this is that consideration number two um, that I'm thinking about for, evening, for our evening together, that once I've identified systems that I want to change, once I've identified systems that might be impacting student performance or student happiness or student well-being, right? That I can think about 
ways that I'm going to change the system, right? And this that I'm describing here is community leadership. No one's going to come down to my classroom and say, well, Cornelius, I need you to change this. Well, Cornelius, I deputize you to change this, right? That, that this is work that we take on on our own, right? Understanding that miracle cures do not exist. Whenever I want to change a system, step one for me is really looking at my class, looking across my department, looking across my grade team and asking myself, who are the kids who are left out of school community, right? And here's how you're going to know this. You're going to know this because of grades. You're going to know this because of attendance. You're going to know this because of participation. You're going to know this because of any number of reasons, right? Now, now here's the thing that I have to do. When I look out at my school community and I ask myself, who's left out? I have to resist the urge to blame the kids, right? That in the story I just told you, it was really easy in that district for them to look and say, well, the boys are scoring really high in AP chemistry and AP physics. The girls are not scoring high. There must be something wrong with the girls, right? That that was like the easy way out, right? I have to resist that, right? And I resist that by asking myself, well, what is it that the kids are left out of? Like, why might the grades for this particular group be low? Why might the attendance for this group be low? Why might the participation for this particular group be low, right? I ask myself, what are they left out of? And once I identify that thing, right? So when I was working in that one district, we identified, okay, the girls are not performing as high as the boys in AP chemistry and AP physics. We've identified that, right? And so then the third question, how do I reimagine that thing to give children more access, right? So the question isn't, how do I fix the girls? How do I make the girls more motivated? The question is, how do I reimagine how we do AP chemistry lab, how we do AP physics lab, so that girls have a viable shot at performing well, right? And so it's the same question that we ask of anything. How do I reimagine the thing to give kids more access? Now, the operative thinking here is that we fix injustice, not kids, right? It's really easy to blame the kids and say, well, what? those girls are the problem. They're just not motivated. Or those girls are the problem. They're just not good at chemistry. No, that wasn't the case at all. The system itself had been built to, you know, and, and the way that it was built ignored the plight of so many young women in that community, right? Now, here's the thing. People didn't build the system because they were mean. People didn't build the system because they were unkind. Nobody in that district gets up in the morning and says, well, I want girls to do bad at science. Rather, the system got built because we weren't 100% sensitive to the needs of some members of our community. Those are really easy mistakes to make in a pandemic, right? And so the question is, how do I reimagine that thing? And then we test our ideas. So I reimagine the thing. And once I reimagine the thing, I do it, right? I try it, right? And I look at the results. Am I getting the same results as before or am I getting better results, right? That that is the work of systemic reinvention, right? And so systems are all around us, right? I think about, again, our seating policies, how we engage kids. You know, I was working in a school not too long ago. And again, several of you who know my work and you know the case studies that I produce, you know, well, I was working in a school where we were facing, um, a huge amounts of suspensions, right? Like when we all came back um, after the pandemic, we're facing lots of disciplinary issues. Like that was a huge problem. And so it would have been really easy to write the kids off as bad, but we asked the question, who's left out and what are they left out of? And we noticed that a lot of the kids were exhibiting the most discipline issues in the classrooms where lecture was the most, right? Where they had lots of lecture, right? And so we asked ourselves, could we reinvent lecture in a way to give kids a better shot at making their way through class in ways that are productive, right? And so I spent time with a group of teachers really thinking about all of the different methodologies that we use to share information with kids. And so we reinvented lecture in more active participatory ways. Um, and then we tried it, right? When we reinvented lecture in more active and participatory ways, we tried it and we gathered our data. We were like, okay, we're experiencing two to three office referrals per day, you know, when we're lecturing at kids. So let's try it this way. How many kids are being referred to the office now? Oh, we're only averaging one now. You know, that's what I mean when we talk about systemic reinvention. Again, I don't have to be the principal. I don't have to be the superintendent. I just have to be attentive in my ways of looking at kids. I have to be curious when I ask myself who's left out and what are they left out of? This gives us the opportunity to do the brilliant work of truly, truly, truly serving all kids. So as I bring this to a close this evening, I certainly hope that I've left you with lots to think about and even more to do. 
right? When I think about the role of professional development, especially in a series like ours, one of the things that I know is that good professional development should not give you all of the answers. As I look out at this Zoom room, I know that I am in a room with some of the most brilliant colleagues in the region, right? That, that good professional development doesn't give answers, rather good professional development illuminates the questions. And so again, I hope that I've left you lots to think about, lots to consider, lots to juggle as we make our way forward into the impossible. Thank you for joining me this evening. My name is Cornelius Minor, and it has been an absolute honor to work alongside you. Thanks everyone for being here. We so appreciate you, Cornelius, for mm -hmm. really helping us to get recentered. I know I wrote a lot of things down as I always learn from you mm -hmm. in your presentations, but tradition present prevents us from pursuing our why was a huge one that I wrote down and just moving through difficulty versus facing difficulty. And so I think there's just a lot of things that you framed that we need to continue to keep at the forefront of our work and just really appreciate you for naming you know, mm -hmm. what we need to direct our time and attention towards and ultimately how we need to spend more intentional time investing and in listening to mm -hmm. the needs of our students as well as surrounding communities. So thank you so much for just your time this evening. Appreciate uh, you. Well, well, thank you all for being here. This is really exciting. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. All right, this is a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know the folks are logging off here. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Emily, Barbie, appreciate you. Yeah, awesome. All right, and is there anything you need? I'll give you a like a text yeah. like, um, when I log off. You're good? I think we're good. All, All right. right. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you so much. Appreciate it. All right, take care. Bye -bye.